Urquhart last winter. Look, the grid's just not built to handle cold. Urquhart in the summer. Y'all ain't gonna believe this, but it turns out the grid can't handle heat either. LOL. Texas, deregulating energy is about freedom. Also, Texas, set your thermostat to 82 degrees or our freedom grid will explode. I think no matter who runs in 2024 in the Democratic ticket, it's going to get obliterated. So I feel like having a centrist would be the best outcome, wouldn't it? Just so at least the neoliberals can't point. Do you think that matters? Do you think that matters? If a neoliberal runs and loses, they'll say we should have run further to the right. Thank you for They're not going to go, wow, you're right. I was wrong about my politics. We should have run or left us. No, they're going to be like, we should move further to the right. There's no case where the sitting Democratic Party's leadership goes, we've got to be more bold. You want me to prove it to you? You want me to prove it to you? I'll prove it to you right now. And by the way, this is an open invitation for any centrist to explain to me how you could support the Democrats after what I'm about to show you. What I was unprepared for, what I, this is uh, 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 one of, uh, of Obama's uh, major advisors talking about what their life was like as Obama. So Obama came into office with 60 senators, a massive, massive landslide victory in the House of Representatives, massive victory at the Electoral College of Popular Vote. Democrats were ascendant at state legislatures and governor's mansions all over the country. The high water mark of the Democratic Party, January 20th, 2009, at least in my lifetime. All right? I want you to read. We're going to read their shit. And you tell me they're not idiots. When Obama was a senator at Springfield, he had the ability to work across the aisle. Now, he's talking about Springfield, Illinois, when he was a state senator in Illinois. Illinois, the Republican Party, is a rump party with no power. All right. The, why the fuck are you working across the aisle with people whose votes you do not need unless you're doing right wing shit? And the Republicans that are in office are basically the personal pets of the Democrats because they have no shot of getting anything done if they want to. You know, even the m most pathetic politician occasionally wants a law with their name on it so they could feel like they did something with their life instead of just sitting there and doing nothing. So what are you talking about? What are you talking about? That was a strategy that he employed and that we all followed when we first arrived in Washington and we hit a wall. Again, super majority in the Senate, massive majority in the House, coming off of a gigantic Democratic mandate. Why are the Democrats trying to work across the aisle? Why are they not trying to enact their agenda as fast as possible during a global worldwide depression? Why? They hit a wall, then go around the wall. It's like, you know, when you sometimes see a, uh, a, a place and there's like a walking path and then there's a gate just for the walking path that's closed, but there's no fence and you can literally just walk around it. I was not prepared for that. And that took some getting used to. He was not prepared for the idea that the Republicans would play hardball. Were you in a coma in 2000 when Republicans stole the election from Al Gore? Were you in a coma in 1994 when uh, Newt Gingrich came into office and did scorched earth politics, eventually leading to Bill Clinton's impeachment for a blowjob? Were you in a coma for the entire United States history after 1980? We tried a, he tried a thousand different ways to get them to come around. TBF, yes, he has been in a coma Okay, for and this is, and this is the thing that if you read this, this is the, this is why. Now, maybe if you're, if you're, if you're watching me and you're a centrist and you're like, like, you just don't know what you mean, you know. He didn't really have 60 senators. He had 58 at that point because Al Gore's election was uh, being disputed and then eventually uh, uh, Ted Kennedy died. And so he didn't really have 60 anyway because of um, Joe Lieberman and other conservative Democrats. And, you know, he just couldn't get anything done. I want you to read this and understand that the Democratic Party, the centrist Democratic Party, is incapable of doing anything. If this had been clear to you and everyone in the administration of January 20th, 2009, what do you think you would have done differently? So in other words... They're saying 
So it's being asked to the Obama advisor, if you knew that the Republicans will never work with you ever with certainty, if you could see the future, what would you have done differently? All right. Are you ready for their answer? Are you ready for their answer? I think we would have done the same thing. And you know that's true because that's what Biden has done. Biden came in. He was part of Obama's administration. We all had copium that he wouldn't do the same shit they did in 2009. But that's exactly what he's done. The same thing. As the saying goes, don't learn from history. And that is to try because it would have seemed unbelievable to us. And we felt that we owed it to the American people to try mightily to change their minds. In other words, he's dug in and he's going to be a cuck no matter what he knows. This is irrational. I actually think, and, and this is my own personal opinion, this man or, and Valerie Jarrett should be mentally committed, involuntarily committed to a mental hospital because they're clinically, provably delusional. They need medicated. And they are a threat to themselves and especially us. So we tried all kinds of strategies to get the Republicans to come to the table and beat us halfway just a little bit of the way. All of the changes and amendments, for example, that were made to the Affordable Air Care Act were designed to try to make it bipartisan. We had the votes if we wanted to push, just push through what we wanted from the beginning. In other words, they could have done the ACA with a public option, bingo, bango, boom, in the first 100 days. And then they could have done all sorts of other shit. But guess what? They decided to run out the entire clock, just like Joe Biden did. That's Braxis. They are losers. They are losers. They are losers. They've got to go. What was it that you could have pushed through from the beginning? We could have pushed through a plan that didn't have all those amendments. There were almost 200 of them, all of which I would put firmly out of my mind. But for example, we really had hope that Olivia, Olympia Snow would have come on board and we worked with her. She did not. We worked with several of the Republicans say, okay, what is it that you need in order to support this? Keep in mind that it was modeled after Massachusetts health care bill that Governor Romney has endorsed. So we started out with a compromise. We didn't start out with a public option or single player. Have you ever thought that maybe you're a pathetic cuck loser piece of shit? The fact that this person can walk around with that, I mean, my God, how do I get people to change? How, how, how? Somebody fucking tell me. How I get people to read this and understand it and do something. And this is the impossible task differently. Why is that important though? Obama tried to be part bipartisan in a lot of different ways. He was still hated by Republicans. The bill was still extremely unpopular with Republicans and until fairly recently with independents. So what was the patriotic was it was either the patriotic value or political value of trying? I think it's a good governance value. I think that you shouldn't be able to... Mm, good governance is bad policy? For us, this wasn't about politics. It was about governing. You're not governing when you fail to pass... Governing is passing policies and making the world better. Governing is not jacking off in DC. You fucking loser. I'm sorry, chat. I don't know how to do... I don't know how to say anything but this. I'm screaming. I'm literally screaming into a void right now. That's how insane these people are making me. When you're elected president of the entire United States, it's important that you're not just appealing to the people who elected you. Stop far smelling your own farts. Stop watching West Wing. Stop fantasizing. I can't stop myself from screaming. This is so insane. This is, you know why I yell? I'll give you an now. Uh, I'm gonna, I can't stop myself. I can't. And I'll tell you why. This is like... Have you ever been a passenger in somebody else's car and they're on the highway and they just start doing the most absolutely batshit dangerous crap? Well, you're a passenger in that vehicle, right? Your life is in their hands. And maybe when you're a teenager, you won't say anything because you're too, you know, you want to be cool. But if I was in the passenger seat of a car and somebody started doing dangerous shit, I would try. Hey, if you do that, don't do that. I would talk to them and say, at first I would try talking to them. And then I would try uh, raising my voice a little bit. And then I would start 
I don't know, yelling at them. And if necessary, I might even try to take the wheel if they were dangerous enough. Right? And it's uncomfortable. You don't want to do that. But it's either that or you sit there timidly until they run you into a wall. I would commandeer the vehicle at 80 miles an hour. I mean, it depends on what's happening, right? If somebody, someone could be doing something dumb enough at 80 miles an hour that you might decide that that was your only hope, right? That's where we're at. For us, this wasn't about politics. It was about governing. When you were elected president of the United States, it's not important that you're not just appealing to the people who elected you. And President Obama was determined to be the president for all of America. You know what your duty is as president? To pass the best policies you can to enhance the well-being of the most Americans. And then to convince them and inform them and educate them about what you're doing and what the outcomes will be. That is what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to have some sort of political circle jerk with politicians. Your job is to promote the general welfare of the United States of America. This is bad governance, not good governance. The reason why it's so important to reach out is that we wanted people who lived in states that who had elected official Republicans to know we were there for them too. You know how you know, let them know that? You make their lives better. That's what FDR did. Now, FDR had some policies and, and made mistakes, especially during World War II. But he got four terms as president because he made people's lives better. He didn't say, I'm going to appeal to the politicians who disagree with you. He said, I'm going to appeal to the people. I'm going to make the people's lives better. And they'll see it. My God. If you want to support Republican policies, run as a Republican. I think if you read this, I don't think it's possible to read this. It's easier to agree on the bills that lobbyists write when you have good relations across the aisle and lobbyist bills are the truly part of bipartisan will of our legislators and overrulers. Yeah. If you want to prevent progressive policies, it makes sense to take over the opposition party and make them feckless. Oh, MB Ryan, you're 100% right. You're 100% right. Your entitlement... Okay. Saw someone say today that people need to get over thinking that you're supposed to get something you want in exchange for your vote. Your entitlement is the reason why women lost their reproductive rights. you rather throw a temper tantrum on this app than be productive and elect more Democrats to Congress. Time for you to grow up and be an adult and vote because we are one step closer to fascism. How did we beat fascism the last time? The Soviet Union and the United States used military force. That's it. And our allies. That's it. And the USSR did 80% of the work, at least in Europe. That's Braxis. Some of the most vivid scenes in the unwinding concern Jeff Con, uh, Connaughton, a politics nerd from Alabama who is 19 when he first spies Joe Biden, then a youthful senator, becomes a lifelong Biden guy, hitching his wagon to the future vice president despite all obstacles, not least Biden himself, who emerges from this book not as a garrulous and folksy, but as self-obsessed and ungrateful. Jeff, don't take this personally, old Biden hand tells him after the senator refuses to repay her years of loyal sweat with a single phone call to commend Connaughton for a job. Biden disappoints everyone. He's an equal opportunities disappointer. Jesus fucking Christ. Respondents were asked to select the most important reason they would prefer a different unspecified nominee over Biden. A third of respondents answered the president's job performance. A third cited his age. And 10% their preference is for Biden not being progressive enough. Biden's support among Dems is a collapse. It's not just a progressive vanguard. I live in a red state that's so gerrymandered that it doesn't matter how much we vote. When we get these entitled ass libs telling us the reason why you lost so much is that you don't vote enough. All they successfully do is piss off people who have voted blue over and over in red states just to lose everything as Dems do nothing. Absolutely nothing. I'm sorry, man. I, I, I know that when I yell, I lose some amount, percentage of people. I think if you're able to listen to what I'm saying, like when I yell, I'm not just doing a primal yelp. I'm actually making arguments that I'm just passionate about. But I do know that some people don't like yelling, you know, for various reasons that are totally valid. Um... Other people, you know, they get with it. They understand what I'm trying to do. They understand what I'm saying. They listen to the words and they agree with the emotion. But I don't know. The reason why, the only reason why I reflect is because I know that we need, we need radical change now. And I don't know what to say. I mean, this is what's coming down the court. This is what's coming down. Like, look at this. Donald Trump's big lie that the 2020 election was stolen is still at the center of Republican politics, especially at the state level in state primaries. We've seen this play out from state to state. The Republican frontrunner to be the next governor of Arizona, Carrie Lake, 
Last week at a primary debate, she used the big lie to bludgeon her opponent, who is not an election denier. When you yell, usually I'm feeling the same way. Unfortunately, it does mean that my MSNBC loving wife is going to be turning her ears off if she's enraged. Yeah, because there's a lot of people that just can't handle the, uh, you know, let's just say that these people are not ready for the coming times. That's all I can say. You can't handle yelling, you know, you're going to have a hard time handling the future. I can tell you that to bludgeon her opponent, who is not an election denier. You've called Joe Biden an illegitimate president. What does that mean? He lost the election and he shouldn't be in the White House. We had a corrupt election. I'd actually like to ask everybody on this stage if they would agree we had a corrupt stolen election. Raise your hand. Did well, we I have a, did we complete fascist? I, I honestly and I, you know, hypothetically, let's just say that hypothetically that it's Germany 1932. Adolf Hitler's on a debate stage. What would you be justified in doing? That's where we're at. We uh, have this is I would question. like to. I, I'm not going to play your, your I think I think the thing that disappoints me the most is I know what's coming, but I'm still not going to do what, you know, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, all right? I'm going to be just as dumb as the libs are. I'm going to keep going on here. I'm going to keep knocking doors and supporting candidates and telling you we need change and you know i'm not gonna outfit a hundred riflemen you know what i mean like yeah you know, i'm just gonna do what i'm doing you know i'm gonna try i'm gonna try to get people to wake up that's the sad thing the sad thing was that she was the most reasonable one on this stage will there be another romeo bet for chat yeah it's usually at the end of the stream stunt she's not gonna play the stunt although the stunt sort of happened right this is a state level race. The January 6th hearings have shown how much pressure was put on state level officials to overturn the elections. And the hearings have also shown how officials like Republican Arizona Speaker of the House Rusty Bowers, a fellow Arizona Republican, who resisted that pressure, ended up playing a key role in saving our democracy. But now, the Supreme Court has agreed to hear a case that could essentially make it easier for rogue state officials to carry out the coup the next time around. Mark Elias is the foremost election lawyer in the country, the founder of Democracy Docket. On this upcoming case, he told The Washington Post Republicans are, quote, learning where the pressure points and vulnerabilities are in our election systems and refining their tactics. And he joins me now. Mark, I have to say that um, people that I follow um, who are not people given to hyperbole or panic sound panicked about the fact the court has taken this case. Explain what this case is and why people are so worried about it. Yeah, so Chris, thanks for having me back. And I am usually among those people who are not panicked by any one case before one court. I always counsel against assuming that any one court decision is gonna dramatically change the landscape. But this case is different because this is a case that Republicans are trying to use to advance a fringe theory that has never been adopted before that says that state courts reviewing state statutes and actions of state legislatures cannot apply their own state constitutions. This is a radical, radical idea that we would strip state courts of the ability of, of protecting voters using their state constitutions. And just to get some context here, this case uh, emerges out of North Carolina, but we've seen in North Carolina in many states um, either states have adopted uh, referenda or state ballot initiatives or state constitutional changes that control how the state is going to do things like gerrymandering, that say that you can't partisan gerrymander. And what we've seen in state after state, Ohio is a place that you've been litigating that we've put a lot of attention. We've seen in North Carolina. What's happened in state after state is Republicans have basically said, screw you, state law. We're going to maximize our electoral strength through gerrymandering. And again, then what often happens, as happened in North Carolina, I believe, and Ohio and other places, is the state Supreme Court, sometimes dominated by Republicans, comes in and say, you can't do this. That's a violation of the state constitution. Republicans want to make that impossible. Is that right? Correct. And not just in the redistricting arena. It would be bad enough to say that the North Carolina state courts can't hold the state legislature to the state constitution and drawing congressional districts. It'd be bad enough that were true with the Ohio Supreme Court and the redistricting process there for Congress. But this would affect state courts like Montana that has struck down voter suppression laws in that state under the state constitution. Pennsylvania, North Carolina, 
Minnesota, uh, uh, Michigan. The list goes on and on. What Republicans want to do is take a vital tool out of the toolbox for those people trying to protect democracy. And that tool are the state courts using state law and state constitutions to hold their state legislatures accountable to those laws. And we should just be clear about the—I mean, I, I hope we're, we're, we're spelling this out clearly, because it could be a little complex. But, but just to give an example here, I mean, what's so dangerous about this is if the state legislature draws its own districts, and it draws it in such a way that, say, a, a, a Republican Party can get 57 percent of the seats with 45 percent of the votes— then they've used this kind of anti-democratic means to kind of barricade themselves in power. And then if the Supreme Court comes along and says, sorry, those guys are essentially unreviewable. They can do whatever they want. You're, you're in a pretty like a vice grip of minority rule then. Right. And Chris, remember, it was only in 2019 that the U.S. Supreme Court said you cannot challenge a, a partisan gerrymandered map in federal court. OK, there's no way to challenge partisan gerrymandering in federal court. That was a 5-4 decision by the yep. Supreme Court. But Chief Justice Roberts said in that opinion, don't worry, <laughs> you're going to be able to go to your state courts, and some state courts will allow you to pursue partisan gerrymandering claims that will protect you from uh, extreme partisan gerrymandering. Well, that's North Carolina. North Carolina's state Supreme Court said, we're going to protect the citizens of North Carolina from this extreme form yeah, do to do. of partisan gerrymandering using our state constitution, because that's what Chief Justice Roberts told us to do. And yet now we're back before the U.S. Supreme Court on whether the state Supreme Court of North Carolina can use the state constitution and to protect its voters. So basically what happened in that that 5-4 decision where liberal John Roberts, remember how they're all trying to make him like some sort of moderate? said that Republicans could gerrymander elections to rig them for their own benefit. They could intentionally draw districts with the purpose of diluting the Democratic Party's representation. That was A-OK. -okay. It was too hard for the courts to figure out. It's not too hard for the Republicans to do it, but it's too hard for the courts to figure it out. That was their 5-4 decision. That was the 5-4 decision. And now, now we have a situation where the U.S. Supreme Court is taking up a case saying state Supreme Courts can't even, state Supreme Courts are not permitted to review that using the state constitution because, and what, this is why it's wild legally. This is why this is really fucking wild. The state Supreme Courts are created by those state constitutions, but so are the legislatures. How could you say that a legislature that gets created by a document is not bound by that document? That is insane! What, they're just bootstrapped out of nothing? Where do they get their legitimacy? Where do they get their power? Through the procedures created by those constitutions. Just realized something. I just realized something. Nothing. Nothing. It's not important. It's not important. Let's keep going. And, and to connect it back to, to what we saw in 2020, there's two connections here. One is that the fringiest version of this theory uh, put forward by John Eastman, Everybody. who's now facing, you know, possible criminal investigation, uh, is that uh, state legislators can basically do whatever they want. They have what he says, plenary power, absolute power, to basically say, you ink from the voters who just elected Joe Biden in the state. Nope, we're not doing that. And then the kind of softer version of that was the Josh Hawley's and the Ted Cruz's who sort of dressed up the coup in this fringe theory that said, well, state legislators and state courts particularly made all kinds of changes to the time, place and manner the elections were had because of COVID. That's illegitimate. We want to strike the votes. But those were arguments on the fringe of coup and insurrection that are pretty related to what the plaintiffs are trying to do here. Yeah. So as you know, Chris, and much of your audience knows, I was involved in litigating more than 60 cases against Donald Trump and his allies at, in the post-2020 period. And this independent state legislature theory came up time and time again, and court after court, Democratic uh, appointees, Republican appointees said nonsense. But this is the single most important doctrine for the Trump Republicans to advance. This is at right. the heart of what John Eastman and Sidney Powell 
and Rudy Giuliani and Donald Trump's other band of misfit lawyers tried to advance. And we won't be so lucky next time if they're able to use this doctrine to strip from state courts the ability to hold their legislatures in check. All right. We are going to keep our eyes very closely on this because I think this is one of the most important things we've seen before the court. Uh, Mark Elias, as always, pleasure to have you on. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I know is that these the situation that we're in is dire are you watching the stream unsubbed you're making income inequality worse you are doing anti-praxis we are the only twitch stream that will not accept scam advertisers and i will never fuck you over by selling you crap